Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and salam. Uh, welcome everybody to MacFest 2023. Thank you for joining us. Please do let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. My name is Katarzyna, I'm a member of the MacFest team, and I'm joining you from France. Uh, today we've got an amazing event um, about travel writing um, with a travel writer, journalist and broadcaster Tariq. And Tariq will be in conversation with Nabs. Uh, she's a writer and a stand-up comedian, uh, featured at the New York Underground Festival, Leicester Comedy Festival and BBC Asian Network. Um, Nabs Pat has uh, over 5 million views and over 50,000 followers on TikTok. And she was named one of the top eight creative Muslim women on YouTube in 2018, alongside uh, Dina Tokyo, Mona Haider, and Tazi Fee by the leading digital online magazine, The Scout. I can't wait for this event to start. Um, and we've got a special guest uh, from the Manchester Metropolitan University, Professor Jess Edwards. Before we start, I'd like to thank everybody for your generous uh, donations that help us create more free events for you. And we are just putting together the program for 2024. If you have any uh, comments or any suggestions or anything specific you'd like to uh, see maybe next year, please connect with us, let us know. Uh, and today share your thoughts and questions. You can also use the Q&A portal to post your questions. Um, and uh, follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok. <laughs> and do use our hashtag spread honey, not hate. So now over to you, Naps. Thank you, Katazina. My name's Nabs Pat. Welcome to this fantastic showcase all about travel writing with Tarek Hussein, journeying through Muslim Europe. So uh, Katazina was in Paris. I am in London. We truly are a global audience. Um, it would be wonderful to hear from you today where you are tuning in from. So do put that into the chat absolutely because we want to know um how far and wide we are reaching you today so we may not be collecting any emails with this uh, travel show um but hopefully it will inspire you uh to maybe look further afield to um some of your more traditional destinations um we are talking about journeying through Muslim Europe. Um, and we have our fantastic guest, Tarek, who's an award-winning author, travel writer, and journalist specializing in Muslim heritage and culture. Uh, Tarek's book, who I have here, um, is Minarets in the Mountains. We will be deep diving into this, um, a journey into Muslim Europe. Uh, it's won countless awards, and I can't wait to hear from Tarek. Tarek, who is joining us right now, firstly, can I just ask, where are you? I'm nowhere too exotic. It, it was going to be somewhere exotic, but I changed my plans, and I'm going there next week. I'm in London as well. <laughs> oh, London is exciting as it gets. Fantastic. Um, we also have um, a guest um, joining us today. I'm very pleased to announce that we have Jess Edwards, who's a professor of place writing and head of the Department of English at Manchester Metropolitan University, who'll be kind of shedding more light on the technical process of um, travel writing. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Jess. Jess, very welcome today. Thank you very Just much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so let's kick off. Um, Tarek, um, I've I, I've been very fortunate to have a copy of your book, um, and I'm really personally excited uh, to be talking to you today about this because, you know, this has been a really a, a fantastic uh, book, which has really inspired me to look further afield from, you know, the traditional destinations that I'm normally um, looking at for my holiday. Um, and I guess I'm going to have to depart from like an all-inclusive package mm -hmm. and, and go further afield, um, but probably pack a few more, uh, you know, just 
trying to plan a more roughing it style trip, um, I guess. I, I think I can ask you a few tips later on about how you managed and survived. Um, but, you know, put it this way. I'm willing to depart from taking the hairdryer with me. Uh, <laughs> this, this is truly inspiring me to kind of like get out there. And because I feel like, you know, the traditional holiday package just isn't as fulfilling as what you've um, taken us on a journey with. Um, and there's so much more out there. And in fact, there's so much more out there beyond a Google search as well. And mm, I guess absolutely. you could only you could only experience that once you've got your um, your own copy of this. Yes, plug, plug, plug. Um, so Tarek, I want to um, understand a bit more about your own journey into travel writing. Um, I know that you come from a teaching background. What ever inspired you to depart from uh, swapping, um, you know, detentions, deadlines, exams for exploring the wonders of the world? Or have I just answered your question? <laughs> yeah, maybe you have. But I just want to go back to the hairdryer thing. I think it's quite apparent I do take my hairdryer with me <laughs> when I go on these trips. You know, you can get them to adapt to the car now. So <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, I think one of the things that you alluded to straight away in, in talking about package holidays and, 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 you know, what you want to get away from is really we're talking about, you know, there's, there's kind of being a tourist and then there's traveling. Yeah. And I think, you know, when, when you're being very touristy, then you do tend to stick to package holidays. You do tend to stick to the more kind of safer, well-trodden paths. And when you're traveling, you really are trying to sort of get away from the comfort zone and try to immerse yourself um, and, and get under the skin of, of a destination. Um, and, and that's really what I've always been very excited about. But it's not something that happens overnight, of course. You know, you, you have to develop a degree of confidence and, and independent travel, certainly within the Muslim culture, is something that is starting to develop now um, o o over here in, in the Western Hemisphere, for sure. Whereas historically, maybe, um, you know, in, in recent times, um, and we can talk a little bit about um, historic Muslim travellers. It's not been our forte. It's not been something we've been, you know, renowned for. And you don't often hear, um, certainly from my generation, you wouldn't hear about, you know, um, students taking a gap year to backpack around the world or anything like that. Not, not from our immediate community, which is, of course, starting to happen now, something my own children are contemplating. Um, but as for my journey, it actually came full circle because I did actually start off writing. So I, I, I actually started off as a journalist. I, I was very much, um, you know, um, keen to be a writer from the off. Um, I, I started in what you might call um, sort of ethnic media. This is before the internet really kind of took over when there were still um, newspapers being bought even within the niche market. So I was writing for an Asian newspaper owned by Trinity Miracle East and I, many of our um, viewers today will probably recall this. It was the red top, you know, it, for, for, for Asians of Britain. Um, and, and of course, since then things have changed dramatically. And that's where I started out. And then I became a little bit disillusioned with kind of mainstream news journalism. You know, and and um, I decided that, you know, I, I was going to go into teaching and, and go into a little bit of um, academia myself um, with, with my master's and and what have you. And um, while, whilst teaching, um, I would often use my holidays to, to travel a lot with my with my family and on my own and, 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 you know, sometimes just with my wife and what have you. And, and of course, over a period of time, two things happen, which I allude to in the book. One is that increasingly when I went to many of these places, especially in the Western hemisphere, I found myself encountering heritage that I felt belonged to me, but nobody had told me about. Mm. And this was really frustrating for me. In fact, I think one of the first times we met Nabs was, was at an exhibition, if you remember in East London Mosque, where mm -hmm. I'd, I'd laid out a lot of my photography from those journeys to, 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 to highlight and bring to people's attention just how rich the Islamic heritage across the Western Hemisphere is. And um, I'd always loved travel writing. You know, I, I love reading people, every, everybody from Dow Rimple, Bryson through to Lee Fermer, um, uh, and we'll come back to why they're all male names later. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I kind of really loved experimenting with that style of writing from, from, from a very early period. And then of course, it occurred to me that maybe I should be continuing to 
engage with that wonderful um, you know, art form of writing, but maybe I could now do it in, a, in, in, a, in an arena that I wanted to, you know, in, 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 in a way that I wanted to engage with it rather than, you know, a, a busy newsroom where you have no autonomy over what you're going to write every, on a day to day basis, very little autonomy at all. Um, you, you go with what the news desk wants and what your editor wants. And here I was, you know, moonlighting and writing about stuff that I that was really interested in and really fascinated by. But I also felt a little bit of a duty because I realized that it wasn't happening otherwise, you know. Mm. No, nobody else was really presenting this rich and wonderful Muslim heritage to um, to audiences or to myself, and and you know we can we can go into it a little bit later. But um, I also began to understand some of the problematic issues um, uh, within travel writing and why that was happening. And I'm sure our academic guest um, Jess will 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 also highlight some of that later as well but that that's pretty much the journey you know I began moonlighting again as a writer and I started to realize there was a real need for it and after that um yeah I I, I was very lucky I managed to get you know I, I tapped into a few of my old contacts and managed to get some stuff published and it just took off from there and 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 the book has of course elevated it to another level well I mean you as you mentioned you've gone full circle um, and you've come back to writing and, and particularly uh, travel writing um, and it's fantastic hearing you know the journey that you've taken to get to this Sorry, destination. we have a special guest who just wandered in oh special guests are hello. more than welcome and oh, actually we would love to hear from your daughter's first-hand accounts of uh, the travel experience because you did actually go with your whole family um, and created this this book this amazing travel log minarets in the mountains if you don't have a copy i highly recommend you um get one um because what it does is it really does challenge perceptions of the makeup of europe and um you know Tarek, you just mentioned that you know you're in east london uh, i know Tarek from east london um because i'm here as well i i'm from east london and if anything many of us east londoners especially from a muslim background are particularly excited about um, the body of work that you've produced, because, you know, when when Muslims get together, we often talk about, uh, you know, either the golden era of Islamic history um, or the kind of untapped destinations that exist. And many of us don't necessarily fully know the ins and outs of uh, the heritage that exists. Um, and whilst there's always been murmurings, what you've done is you've taken it to this kind of mainstream um, level of um, access and um, you've got a lot of supporters here in East London because of it uh, and so I know you've made a lot of people proud about um, taking this information to a wider audience and if anything um, you're challenging those perceptions that often are about how Europe is predominantly just Christian Judeo um, in terms of makeup even sometimes pagan um, and, and you're widening that field. What would you say is to blame for that kind of um, viewpoint, that narrative that exists, uh, which then often gets um, um, transferred to maybe news stories, uh, even other cultural outputs like films, you know, because we, we just don't get that kind of diverse makeup. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. I think you know, I, I began to feel this responsibility because I realized that there was this shocking imbalance in the way, um, you know, the, the Muslim heritage of Europe, which, of course, our very informed listeners will know, stretches all the way back to the very beginning of Islam. You know, Islam is not new to Europe, and yet we are um, led to believe that somehow it is. And in, in, in terms of what is to blame, there's a very short answer and then there's a slightly longer answer, which, of course, um, later on, um, Jess could um, dip into as well. The short answer is really quite simple in many ways um, in that, you know, um, when you look at historically the battles that took place for who who controlled Europe and who who was um, going to be the culturally dominant space. I mean, sorry, the culturally um, dominant, um, the, the dominant culture in Europe that's who then goes to write the popular history. And that's who consciously decides to write out those who were the losers. If we flip that around, we have a similar scenario going on in somewhere like the Middle East, because I'll often have people say, oh, you're always banging on about Islam in Europe. What about, what about Christianity in the Middle East? Why don't you bang on about that? And, and it's like, 
that's not what I'm writing about. But yes, I, I agree there's an issue there as well, because, of course, again, in the Middle East, you could argue it was Islam that quote unquote won. And so we have a situation where the historic writers of, of the cultural narrative, the, the nation building narratives of those spaces have consciously chosen to do that. And I always use the example of when I went and wrote um, the guidebook for Saudi Arabia for Lonely Planet, you know, I really struggled to, to, to engage with some of the historical non-Islamic spaces. And of course, again, many, many listeners and viewers will be aware that now Saudi Arabia has opened up, everyone suddenly has realized that there's a second Petra there. There's, there's all these amazing pagan sites. And, and hopefully at some point we, we might even go into some of the historic Abrahamic sites. And it was very, very difficult for the very same reasons, you know? Um, and sometimes those reasons are quite sinister um, you know, and sometimes they are clearly being consciously done to, to present particular spaces in a particular way. And in my book, I, I show how that's still going on to this day. Um, and then what happens, of course, is, is the unassuming individuals who, who are being subjected to this literature, who are brought up in this, yourself included, myself included, and almost everybody in the Western Hemisphere, the literary heritage that we grow up in, be it travel writing, be it history writing, is it then skews our view. And we are then walking into somewhere like the Alhambra and we're shocked mm. that there's Islam in Spain. Mm. How, how can we be shocked? Islam was in Spain longer than the, the, the modern Castilians have been there. You know, it, it was there for nearly a, a century. But yet we're shocked. And, and this is why we're shocked, because of the way in which it's been normalized. And, and often we have this very um, cozy term, um, uh, you know, Europe is, has this Judeo-Christian heritage, which I, which I find really problematic when you look at the Judeo-Christian relationships in Europe historically, where, um, you know, the historic Christian communities more often than not oppressed the Jewish Christian, I mean, sorry, the Jewish communities. So there was no cozy Judeo-Christian alliance historically at all, um, you know, and, and no, no historian will, will try and negate that. Um, if there was a cozy alliance between anybody and the Jews in, in Europe, it was between Jews and Muslims. And, and, and of course, you've read the book and you know that that happened on, on a wonderful scale, it, it, relatively speaking, across Ottoman lands because of the millet system. And of course, prior to that, it was happening um, under what has romantically been called La Convivencia in, in, across Iberia. But if you put the two phases together, then actually for the vast majority of Europe's history, um, the, the cozy alliance, the friendly alliance was between Muslims and Jews if, and Christians, of course, because Christians also lived in those lands um, and, uh, and were protected as well for the for the very same reasons. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a very warped, it's a very skewed way of looking at it. And then what it does, as you've alluded to, Nabzis, it starts to lend itself to those individuals. And, and we we heard a lot of them in 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 uh, during the Brexit vote here in 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 Britain, and I'm sure we hear it across Europe, where of course we've seen sadly a, a rise in the far right who who want to claim that somehow Muslims don't belong here, Muslims aren't a natural normal natural part of this landscape. And of mm. course, in my book, I I point out that there are actually three quote unquote Muslim countries in Europe at least three countries. You know, Kosovo is over 90%, one of the countries I visit. Um, Bosnia is over 50%. Um, and, and of course, you then also have Albania, which is over 70% according to, the consent, uh, according to the census. So these are Muslim countries. But if you were to say to somebody, Europe has Muslim countries, anywhere in the world, they'd look at you and, and, and ask if you were feeling okay and maybe if you'd had enough water that day. Mm -hmm. Well, I know you do touch on um, the the kind of roots behind Islamophobia in your exploration as well. So I'd, I'd love to touch on that um, and hear you shed light on it. But if there's any doubt that um, the word about a journey into Muslim Europe is not getting further afield, just to let you know, Tarek, uh, we are being joined uh, by viewers from uh, Illinois in USA. Um, we have people up and down the UK, Leeds and Oxford. Hello to Hiba, hello to Nigath. Um, and of course, we've got um, tu uh, people tuning in, or should I say zooming in, uh, <laughs> from Munich, Germany, uh, Gloucestershire in the UK, San Antonio, Texas, UK Wales. Um, and we have even more people tuning in as we speak. Uh, Spain, Texas, Wales, France. It's amazing as uh, you've just people. given me the 
by, by mentioning Munich, you've given me the perfect opportunity to plug my German translation, which has just come out. As so anybody in Germany, please do go and buy that. In fact, we've just had a really lovely review in the, I think it's the Swiss German um, media by, um, by a journalist there, which has really championed it and, and spoken about how, of course, in, in Switzerland, minarets are banned. And so mm -hmm. to have a book about minarets in the mountains, he, he starts with the line, Switzerland has mountains, but doesn't have minarets. And is that a problem? <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's the first, hopefully, of a few more translations. Fantastic. And for a book that was published in 2021, that, that is making a great um, feat of achievement. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, if you've just tuned in, welcome to McFest's discussion about travel writing with our guest speaker, Tarek Hussain. My name's Nabs Pat. I am your host for today. So please do get your questions in to the chat. I will be asking Tarek and also our other uh, guest speaker, Jess Edwards, Professor Jess Edwards, um, to explore the, the whole uh, concept and process behind travel writing. And uh, we are currently hearing from Tarek Hussain, who is talking about his own personal journey into travel writing. Uh, um, put it this way. I'm about to take my hairdryer as well. Now that he's giving me that tip, I just need to take a plug in, don't I, for a car. I'll, I'll be sure to do that. Um, so Minarets in the Mountains um, is a great travel log. Um, something that often comes to mind when I'm uh, thinking of travel logs, especially in today's Western modern day times. Um, I, I, the names that come to mind, uh, especially from a British perspective, Michael Portillo, um, Michael Palin, um, you may notice a trend here, mm -hmm. white men. <laughs> yeah. uh, but of course, you've taken on a very specific style in this exploration. You have taken the pathway of another well-known uh, traveler, um, an Ottoman traveler, Evelia Chevalier. Um, I hope I pronounced uh, his name correctly. Don't worry, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong as well. It's it's a Turkish um, name, obviously, Evelia Chelebi. And um, Elia Chelebi is um, the great 17th century Ottoman traveller, um, one of these great Muslim travellers of history who we all seem to know very little about. And um, I, I've made it a life mission to, to make sure everyone knows more about. So Elia Chelebi travels with me throughout this period. Um, um, and incidentally, for, for anybody who hasn't read the book, my family is with me. You know, this is a road trip in a car four of us, uh, my, my wife and my two daughters, who also have mixed heritage as well. And so what I've, what I've tried to do in this book is the reason I go to Elia Chelebi, and I'm very, very lucky because I'm standing, the, I'm standing on the shoulders of, of scholars who have translated Chelebi's work so that I'm able to use it, is I had to go all the way back to Chelebi to find any writing in the English language written by Muslims looking at what I call Muslim Europe. In other words, lens, Muslim lens on Muslim history in Europe. And the reason I, that's important is because all the other writing that I was coming across, and you've alluded to who they were mainly written by, they tended to be white privileged men. Um, and I've got nothing against white privileged men. Plenty of them are, are my friends and, and many of them are writers that I spend time with at literature festivals. But what they did is they they colonized that space. This is what this is what we allude to when we talk about decolonizing a space in travel literature. Is when they when 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 a space is colonized and and dominated by a particular voice, mm. then we have this skewed um, situation, um, this skewed perspective on Muslim heritage. And so what I was finding is, when I was looking back and reading literature on the Balkans on on Muslim culture, it was consistently being spoken about as being something other than Europe or, or the, in other words, the Western writers concept of Europe and um, people who were non-Muslim, they saw it as something separate from their own culture. Whereas Elia Chelebi, who was very much a European, an Ottoman who was traveling at, just after the very zenith of the Ottoman Empire, when Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent was at, at his throne, who's, who, who um, Elia, Chelebi's, Elia Chelebi's father served, um, he was basically traveling through this area when it was the most Muslim it was it, it had ever been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In other words, Elia Chelebi was going to also do two things for me. First of all, he was going to show me how somebody who, other than myself, who is Muslim, sees this heritage and culture and embraces it as their own and doesn't see it as separate from Europe, which is a very important um, thing to point out. And secondly, he was also going to show me 
when it was the most Muslim it was, as opposed to now, and therefore allow me to assess just how much might have been eradicated since then, and was being continuously and systematically eradicated. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why Elia Chelebi's lens was so important, as well as, of course, it was just, it's just a fantastic exercise. I think it's Tim McIntosh Smith, you know, one of the great travel writers who brings us the other great Muslim travel writer, many will know, Ibn Battuta. He famously said, well, not famously, sorry, he said to me in private that, you know, it's the closest we come to tra um, time travel, Tariq. And it is, you know, you, you have Elia Chelebi looking at it in the 17th century, and then you lift your head up from the pages, and you're now looking at it in the 21st century, and it's like, my gosh, you know, either it's changed dramatically or it hasn't. And, and, and that, uh, that's a wonderful device. But the thing that you were alluding to, of course, is that suddenly I was seeing the Balkans through the eyes of someone who saw the Muslim heritage, the Muslim people there as just a normalized part of the European landscape. And just before I let you jump in, Nabs, I just want to give people one quick example of how Evliya Chelebi did this. Um, and it'll be a nice one rather than one of the more sinister ones. So I'm sitting on the plane. We're about to get land in Sarajevo. And I am beside myself with excitement because, you know, I, I'm like a little boy in a sweet shop. I'm about to go to the Jerusalem of Europe. How exciting, you know, Sarajevo, where, where Christians, Jews, and Muslims live together, something apparently so exotic and fantastic about Sarajevo. I land, I start reading Elia Chelebi, and he completely flattens the atmosphere. Because of course, to Elia Chelebi, there's nothing exotic about this. This was the norm. He reminds me that the town up the road called Novi Pazar was the same. He tells me that it was happening in Mostar. And, and he talks in such a matter of fact way, he mm. normalizes this. The reason I was so excited, the reason I was getting so, you know, um, beside myself was because the literature I had read, predominantly written by people from the other side of Europe who saw this as exotic because it wasn't normalized where they were. Mm -hmm. That's why. And so that's, that's quite a funny, nice little example. But of course, at various moments, it takes a sinister turn. Well, Tarek, the the excitement that you talk about is very palpable in your writing. And later on, I will ask you to give us a small rendition of an extract um, so that we can actually get a taste of uh, your journey and voyage. Um, but, you know, I, I think what you mentioned about Evely Chevely um, is the fact that, you know, he had a very matter of fact style. How do you go about, you know, if you are a fellow traveler who's going in the footsteps of this Ottoman traveler, how do you go about deconstructing it and looking at it through a different lens? Because from what I've understood about this traveler is that he was also very pedantic. He was, um, you know, almost auditing yes. the, the things he was coming across. How do you go about deconstructing that, show, infusing the excitement, and of course, creating a very vivid imagery? Um, and did you, from the work, from his body of work, were you able to get insights into a kind of vivid image, or you felt like it was just very matter of fact and almost needed that extra uh, layer of frills? I, if I can. Yeah. No, no, I know what you mean. Of right. course, historic travel writing, we might call it travel writing now, but he was very much part of the administration. He was he was going around. The reason he was allowed to travel and have all these travels was because he was offering to do the admin work. And so often he was carrying out audits. He was telling me how many Muslim households were in this place, how many Jewish households, how many Christian households. But then also Evie Chelebi does have a wonderful personality as well. One of the reasons people like to hang out with him is because he was a great boon companion. You know, he he could he could recite beautifully he could he was he was actually a, a scholar of islam in many ways he was a hafiz and you know he, he knew the quran off by heart it was one of the one of the reasons he would he, he he caught the attention of the sultan is because of how beautiful his recitation was but he's also a bit of a joker apparently and we get nuggets of that you know coming through but historic travel writing isn't modern travel writing let's be clear about that you have to work very hard to take the likes of you know, Elia Chelebi's very kind of, um, you know, matter of fact and admin type of writing. And you have to find ways to then bring that to life. And, and you bring that to life in a number of ways, or certainly I do, of course. Um, I try to bring it to life with my own thoughts, with my own comparative thoughts. I also bring in local characters. I engage with local people. This is one of the things that I think makes it very, very um, 
um, it sort of elevates it and takes it from a dry, um, you know, um, kind of documentation of, of what Evlia saw, what I'm seeing, you know, which would be a very dry book and, and I doubt anybody would have read it and you wouldn't be holding it right now. Um, so that, that's where the skill of the writer obviously has to come into it. You know, um, and and I noticed earlier a question popping up, um, and and I know we'll go to questions later, but just because this is part of my answer, um, How the you only go about way, writing? the only way to write good travel writing yeah. is to read good travel writing. It's really that simple. People, you know, since I've written the book and even before that, would come and say, you know, I want to write this or I want to do that, and 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 I'm very blunt with people because you have to be, you know, and I'm like, how much of it do you read? And, and we have that awkward silence. And, you know, if you've never read good travel writing, how are you going to write good travel writing? You, you, you just can't. You know, if you if you want to be a biography writer, you have to read biographies. If you want to write if you want to write great pieces of literature, you have to read great pieces of literature. And so it's it's from the writers of the past, um, the great travel writers of the past um, that I've also learned that skill. Well, no, wise words indeed. And thank you for actually answering the very question I was actually about to take a, <laughs> take a kind of um, dive into. Um, so Tarek, um, you know, your, your, your voyage um, is across the Balkans um, and it would be great if you could um, give us a showcase of the various different stopovers you made. Um, and it would be lovely to hear about what, one or two destinations come to mind yeah. or moments that were your favorite and why yeah sure i mean i if 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 you're okay with it i'll, I'll share my screen I've, I've got a little mat and then i'll show a few pictures of places i stopped and why those pictures are significant so um yeah i'll just pop that up now i hope i'm allowed to share screen it says i am okay right now if you can tell me if you can see what you're supposed to be seeing can you see um, a powerful implementation yeah it's back to school again, Tarek. Exactly right. Is it <laughs> is it in full screen mode? Uh, not in full screen mode. Now it is. Great. OK, so um, we'll ignore the first bit because normally I do the whole presentation, but this is the map. And then in the top right hand corner, we can see Elia Chelebi uh, or an artist impression of him. Um, and he's he obviously joined us and, and you see all these kind of zigzagging squiggles. But essentially, we started here in Sarajevo and we kind of did a, a, a loose circular um, route that took us first into Serbia. From Serbia, we went into Kosovo. We had to come back into Serbia for various reasons I'll go into later. North Macedonia, which has changed its name since I visited because of the political situation there. Um, into Albania, through Montenegro, back to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the reason we, wrote, we chose this um, route, of course, is one, it takes us through the three countries that I said to you before, demographically, population-wise, are quote unquote Muslim. Um, and two, the, the areas we stuck to where um, I'd done the research prior or, or our nose led us there or Elia Chelebi led us there is because it, it was areas where we knew there was indigenous local Muslims or vast amounts of Muslim history and heritage that was still there. Um, so there are a number of reasons why the route became what it is. But essentially, we wanted to explore what I consider to be my living European Muslim heritage in this corner. That's not to say it's not in other places. Of course it is. But, you know, uh, there was no way I was going to cover all of that in one book. Um, so I I'm just going to take you to a few of the places that really um, excited me on this journey. Um, we won't talk about that now. We can come back to that. So the first place, most people know this, the iconic Mostar Bridge. But as most people will also know, what they're looking at is not the original of course, because the original was destroyed during the 90s war. And it was destroyed as part of what, what many considered to have been a systematic effort to eradicate the Muslim heritage of this area and, and um, of this region, in particular Bosnia. And the irony is, of course, that even until very recently, um, most Western commentators wouldn't even consider the bridge as being Muslim. There was a, a famous English archaeologist who said it had to be Roman. You know, it, there was no way Muslims could have built something so stunning and spectacular. Um, and, and one famous um, um, French painter describes it as being this Latin marble in the midst of Turkish barbarity. And this is as late as the, you know, turn of the um, 19th century. So even though the, the evidence was compelling, the Islamophobia was even more terrifying. Um, and I went to this place for a number of reasons, one of them being that Elia Chelebi visited it. 
and, and one of the cool stories is when he visits it, people are diving off the bridge just as they are diving off now. But back then it was just kids, local kids who would just throw themselves off screaming Ya Allah, which of course now would really have a very different effect on people. <laughs> and now it's, um, it's this kind of individual with an Olympic body, you know, streamlined, uh, posing and then diving in like they belong in, in, in the local Olympic Games. And back then it was just kids throwing themselves off to get some money off the local pashas when they visited. Um, and then just not too far from Mostar, just south of Mostar, this is the Blagai um, Teki, which is a Sufi lodge um, um, that was originally um, um, founded and built by the by a, a, a Sufi mystic order known as the Bektashis, and now in the custody of the Naqshbandis. Um, two reasons here. Um, again, Elia Chelebi. Um, this was a very um, special place for Elia Chelebi to visit because he, of course, um, listeners um, and viewers may have heard in the way I'm trying to describe Elia's name that it sounds very much like the word Elia because that's what it is. It's it's Aulia. It comes from Aulia, um, and there's my English accent making it very very awkward. But um, Aulia, <laughs> as in a friend of God, which is what Elia's first name is is in this particular instance, and. He was very much of the spiritual inclination and he would seek out spaces like this. And I wanted to visit it because I, I did not know anything about the Bektashis before I went there. And they're very much a European Muslim mystic order. You know, this is also the heritage that I knew nothing about. And this was a great space to go and explore that. Um, and of course, a, a beautiful place as well. Um, it's been renovated and people can go there and actually take part in, in, in some of the um, practices um, on days that they allow visitors, but it's also a tourist space as well as an active space of worship. Um, here is, a, is another place um, in, in Bosnia, but this is in the middle of Bosnia, um, um, in, in, in a friend's hometown. And the only reason I went there is because the friend led me there, Zanich, and, and this, this gentleman here, um, an, an effendi who looks after the library is, is holding open a beautiful book. Um, and I put this picture up here just to highlight how many of these historic gems may have been lost and are just lying, um, are sitting on, on um, quote unquote, insignificant libraries across these lands. Um, the book we're looking at is, is a rare book because it's actually a book on Shafi and Hanafi fiqh combined, which is our Muslim listeners will know is very, very unusual. But even more amazing, this book is older than Sarajevo. And, mm. and, you know, this gentleman just nonchalantly pulled it off, off the shelf to show me. And there was no glass cases or anything involved. And, and this is our heritage just, just in these spaces. Um, and this place here in Kosovo, just outside Pristina, one of the main reasons I, I pushed our family, um, well, we, me and my wife both took the plunge, but the main reason I wanted to go, because um, before we got we entered Kosovo, we, we had a lot of um, kind of concerns because of the way Kosovo is represented, because of the way, of course, um, there are so many embargoes against it. And of course, um, Serbia is amongst the countries that refuses to to still um, recognize its autonomy. Mm. Uh, um, but we had to go there because this is um, the one of the one of the shrines and uh, one of the tombs of Sultan Murad the first who of course in many ways for me was the grandfather of modern Muslim Europe, because it was Sultan Murad who, who comes over with the Ottomans and enters Europe proper. And, and he dies in the Battle of Kosovo, here on the plains of Kosovo, outside modern day Pristina, um, in, in, in a war that has been depicted often as being Christianity versus Islam, but anybody that's looked into it knows there were several Serbian princes on his side as well. Um, but in the end, it is the main battle that decides whether or not the Ottomans enter Muslim proper. So it's a significant space. And of course, um, he has two tombs, as many early Ottoman um, sultans did, because they would go out and actually fight because they considered themselves to be Ghazis, war warriors of God, and fighting meant often dying. And, and so when they died, they would bury their organs where they died, and then they would take the embalmed body to the imperial tomb. Um, one, another one here, um, which is um, in North Macedonia, in, in Skopje, known as Uskup during the time of the, of, of the Ottoman um, period. This is on the front of the cover. It's one of my favorite places purely because it's such a cliche term here, hidden gem, as, as all of North Macedonia was. I landed in Skopje knowing very little about it to realize the town looked as though, in, in the center, it looked as though it had been untouched since the Muslim period, it looked so uh, Islamic still and, and had so, many, so much Ottoman history and heritage. But the clock is here because um, Uskup becomes one of the key administrative um, centers 
for the Ottomans when they entered this part of Europe. And, and actually, um, they reportedly installed what is Europe's very first clock tower in that on that very spot. Obviously, at the time, it was probably wooden. And this is the modern incarnation. But if you look halfway down, you can see the neglect in the way it's been preserved. I think since then, since our visit, there has been renovation work done. Um, so there's just a few there. There's more, but but I know that we, we want to bring in Professor Edwards as well. And we want to talk about other things. So I'll stop sharing for now, Nabs, if that's OK. Well, that's fine. Um, well, thank you for um, showcasing those photographs. Um, I, I know um, I found them really, really interesting, uh, especially seeing... Uh, one or two uh, pictures of people as well, which leads me to my next question about, you know, the people that you met. Um, I, I I mean, I know we're talking about um, uh, Muslim Europe as though, uh, you know, you've just finally discovered it, like you know, <laughs> yes. Christopher Columbus has discovered, yeah. uh, you know, Cook. America. Yeah, uh, but, you know, obviously <laughs> these people exist today um, as they have done for centuries. Um, and I guess maybe because of me not knowing too much about the heritage that exists, but I'm fascinated being a fellow Muslim uh, to just explore and understand this a little bit more. How much of the traditions, especially the Islamic traditions, still exist amongst the communities? Um, or how much has changed over time uh, since uh, Evelia Chevelia's uh, experience? I think quite a bit has changed because, of course, most people will know and they may have caught that slide that that slipped through um, where I had a map up of, of Europe in split in two. Of course, until very recently, this entire region um, was very much behind the Iron Curtain. Um, so so communism, which by definition is is anti-religious. Um, and, and um, individuals like the dictator Enver Hoxha in Albania went out of their way to eradicate all religion, not just Islamic um, you know, practices and not just Islamic monuments. Um, and so one of the reasons that we are often told that um, this part of Europe is so different to us, one of the reasons we always have to qualify mentioning this part of Europe by the prefix Eastern is apparently because it was by, behind a communist wall for so long. That's why they're so different. No, that's really not the reason, because mm -hmm. it may have been communist Europe for about 60 years or so, maybe 80 at a stretch. OK, it was Muslim for six centuries. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it different. And that's why we don't like it. If we're blunt, that's why we other it. Even today in the terminology we use, the reason people are shocked when I say there's Muslim countries in Europe is because they don't consider Eastern Europe as being Europe proper. There's Europe and then there's Eastern Europe. I never have to tell somebody where Germany is by saying it's in Western Europe. But I have to. And of course, Germany is an interesting one because that's where the war was. But I have to tell people, you know, I, oh, I was in, um, you know, in Albania, in, in Eastern Europe. And then and then they're like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, OK. And you can almost see them, the, the cog moving where they're like, oh, yeah, well, that's not really Europe proper, is it? Because that's that's sadly the, the kind of prejudice that remains. And, and for me, it's a convenient one for those in Western Europe who, who do not want a, a, an indigenous Muslim face to be a part of the European landscape. But coming back to what you were saying, because I realize I've completely ignored the question. So I do apologize. No, um, no, it's we, fine. We, we have we have various, um, like we have lots of things going on across this beautiful region where people are rediscovering their heritage. And I will focus obviously on the Muslim side of things. People are doing it within their Christian heritage, some even in their Jewish heritage um, and, and other, other areas as well. Um, there are, there are some people um, like the Bosnians, for example, great example. Um, they, they have re-established a kind of centralized muftiat system where you will see scholars being trained in a wonderful way. You know, it's, I remember it was the Bosnians that famously said, what, what, what is this debate that people keep having? You know, can Muslims be European? Why don't they just come and see us? We've been Muslim and European for 600 years. You know, and it's, it's such a great point, you know, like, like, like you said, like they've been hidden or something um, it's, such a, so yeah. it's such a mic drop moment as well absolutely to hear that absolutely. statement yeah and, and it's very true what you say about you know that sentiment of um eastern europe not really belonging to europe proper um if anything those were some of the sentiments shared uh, and undertones of the brexit campaign as well um so yeah i, I can i can actually see yeah that. absolutely i think the two got married very very closely which was really interesting for me in that 
apparently the thing we were supposed to fear is Eastern European immigrants and the Muslim swarms that were going to come and invade us if we kept our borders open, you know. Um, and, and for me, what I found is I found scary parallels in the way historically that part of Europe, when it was Muslim Europe, when it was Ottoman Europe, would also be othered back then. It was the same thing. So I, I sometimes think some of the racism towards Eastern Europeans and Eastern Europe that we still witness on a day-to-day -day basis here in the UK and probably across Western Europe um, unconsciously stems from that historic Islamophobia Western Europe always had for, for that side. Mm. Well, on, on this particular subject, this nicely segues into my question about Islamophobia. You do delve into exploring the roots of Islamophobia in your travel log. What, what took you in that direction? Uh, because travel logs um, by nature aren't often very politicized, but you yeah. do go into depth about exploring your own identity, bringing in your own uh, immigrant background uh, that exists, as well as your own family's background. And then I think it will be great to bring in Professor Jess Edwards about, you know, the, the kind of connections between exploring place identity through literature. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, I could not have, by the way, I'm, I'm, you know, I am an immigrant. I was born in Bangladesh. So I, it was very much, you know, from the minute I was born, travel was a part of who I was, not through choice necessarily. And so travel movement has always been in my blood, shall we say, um, but for various reasons. And, and the way I write and, and the places I explore are of course about exploring my identity as well. This is why I was exploring so much Muslim history across Europe is because I felt it was my heritage. And so I could not talk about that history and heritage. I could not talk about why it was being um, quote unquote hidden from the mainstream popular authorized narratives without discussing Islamophobia. Um, and also I could not, not talk about Islamophobia purely because, you know, I, I've grown up in the age of 9-11 when everything dramatically changed. And I know for older generations, that was the Rushdie affair. But certainly for me, you know, I was actually a journalist sitting in the Eastern Eye offices on 9-11. So it was a big, big moment. And, and actually in, in many ways, what with the fallout of 9-11 in the media played a massive part in the reason I stepped away from frontline news journalism. Um, and, and it's something that I, I, I'm probably going to go into other books. But in this book, I, I am talking about my identity because Islamophobia played a big part in, in, in my existence on a daily, it plays a big part, sorry, in my existence on a daily basis. You know, mm -hmm. whether that's, um, you know, having to justify, um, uh, sorry, not just fine having to seem um, feel like we have to apologize everybody somebody every time somebody does something in the name of islam even even though it's quite apparent that they have no idea what islam really is you know every time um we we, we read the pull out the newspapers and you know you just have to do a simple audit of the of the positive and negative stories about islam in in the british press and and, and i dare say across the western hemisphere and it's ridiculously imbalanced so islamophobia is a very much sadly a part of our everyday existence and you know this nabs as a muslim yourself and mm. and just before 9 11 and i make this point in the book for me it was less about my religion and more about my color but i felt something switch afterwards and 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 that probably played a part in pushing me to explore it because when somebody is is targeting you for a particular reason you you immediately want to understand what that is Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that played a big part in, in my journey to try and explore this history and heritage, um, be it consciously or unconsciously. Mm. On this uh, point, it would be great to bring in uh, Professor Jess Edwards um, to perhaps expand on this kind of concept of travel writing, a uh, sense of self. I know that this is something that you have focused on in your own um, academic work, um, you know, with modern history um how how relevant is this you know where you know people are um tapping into travel logs is it often from that kind of political slant to try and understand their sense of self or is this a kind of like a new phenomenon that's a really big question <laughs> and i don't want to i don't want to take up too much time here because this is an amazing conversation um i'm really really enjoying this and i'm very much not i mean Tarek is far more of an expert in travel writing than i am 
Um, and, you know, in the history, I mean, some of the history he's been talking about is absolutely fascinating and I'm learning a lot from this. I mean, I'm very, I'm very interested and, and always have been in the relationship between writing and place. Mm -hmm. um, I always say to people and I kind of scandalize a lot of my colleagues in academia and, and the writers I work with. I, I work in a, in a writing school or in a, an English department which has a huge writing school. We've got about 35 creative writers um, who I work with. And I scandalize people when I say that when I read, I'm not really very interested in story. I'm not very interested in, in people, even in characters. I'm always interested in, in where literature, whatever kind of literature it is, um, its ability to take you to a place. Um, and the literature that, that's excited me, I guess, in my own sort of reading career, in my own academic career, has always been about an intense immersion. I think immersion is a word I'm very fascinated by, what that means. Um, everything from, I mean, Tarek's, you know, you, your investigation of history and of the of the historical sort of resonance of place um, is utterly eye-opening and people who read your book will have their eyes opened in that way. Sometimes it's also, and travel writing is very much about this, it's also much more of a sort of sensory immersion in place. Um, which I find very, you know, very uh, intoxicating as well. And one of the things that I think has happened recently, I think we all knew what we thought travel writing was. Um, and there is, I mean, you've mentioned some of the kind of classic writers in the European, you know, kind of canon of travel writing. And you've also talked about the way in which, you know, you and I think other people recently have tried to expand that canon. Um, and I, I certainly grew up in academia when we were looking, we were trying to look further afield and we were trying to hear, you know, the voices of Muslim travellers in Europe. Um, I, my own sort of academic study began with the early modern period um, and it was often ambassadors and, and things like that. But I think um, over the past, my sense is over the past uh, maybe, you know, 20 or 30 years, um, and it's partly about that, that re-evaluation of the sort of Orientalist um, sort of tradition that, uh, that uh, travel writing is part of. We've sort of lost confidence in this as a genre. It's still happening, obviously, and it's still very popular. And, and, and alongside travel writing has grown up um, all sorts of other forms of non-fictional. We often talk about creative non-fiction nowadays, don't we? Uh, writing which also explores our relationship with place so you know people sometimes talk about place writing now and, and we have a at my own university we have something called the center for place writing um you know there are popular writers I have to say an awful lot of them white men I mean I always think of Robert McFarlane the writer Robert McFarlane always pops into my head when I'm thinking about place writing someone once described his writing as uh, you know the lone enraptured male and, and, and in a way that inherits, the lone enraptured male sort of inherits, it's a bit of romanticism and it's a bit of that, that figure of the, you know, the, the, the European traveller with his, you know, his, it wouldn't be a rucksack, but whatever, it would be, it'd be a dusty satchel or something like that. So, yeah, I think um, we are engaged in uh, a re-examination of what it means to write about place. Um, the thing that I'm interested in and have become interested in most recently, I've been very involved. Um, I mean, I know we've got some people, uh, maybe some people from Manchester here. We're very much in a global space here, in a global virtual space. Um, but I live and work in Manchester, which is one of the most multilingual, multicultural cities on earth. Um, and, and I think there is the research to back that up, certainly around multilingualism um, and everything that lies behind multilingualism. Um, I was involved with other colleagues and people in the city council and so on in putting in a bid um, a few years ago um, for Manchester to become a city of literature, a UNESCO city of literature. So we've joined this thing called the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. Um, and it's all about a creative, a UNESCO creative city is a city in which literature plays a, a really important role economically, socially, and is in some sense an engine of policy um, which drives sustainable development because UNESCO is all about sustainable development and the sustainable development goals which people may know about. For me, um, in round about 2017 when we started doing that work, it was all about discovering, rediscovering the city I worked in. 
and that's what's the, the little touch point because we 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 work in, di in very different areas and on different things but the touch point for me between uh what Tarek's doing and what i'm interested in and what i've been working on i guess recently has been rediscovering a place you thought you knew so when we started that when you when we started talking about manchester as this place in which literature was as important as literature in dot 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 all these places around the world that had, that had won this bid um you begin with what you think you know so we we talked about elizabeth gaskell and and the relationship between writing and the industrial Re revolution we talked about engels who lived in manchester and wrote in manchester we talked about anthony burgess the author of clockwork orange who came from there but of course the more um we the journey since we got that designation has been all about discovering the literature, uh, literary cultures of our city, which are multiple and diverse. And when I first got to know Kesra, it was because it was right at the beginning of that journey and MacFest had just begun. And I thought, oh my God, this is exactly what we need. I, I want to know, I want to be part of this and I want to just be there and listen and learn and meet people and listen to people as I am doing today um and there was this light bulb moment which i always talk i always end up talking about at, at macfest because it was it was like a, a moment i will never forget and it was a landmark in my own sort of journey as a as an academic we we met some people who run uh mashiras um in manchester so poet, urdu poetry parties i'm going to call them because they're not <laughs> <laughs> they're poetry parties there's food yeah everybody's involved you know the audience is completely you know they they all shout and respond to the poetry and so on and we just said can can we do one of those at our university because that's never happened before um you know they they often take place in community centers out in you know predominantly south asian parts of the city and so on so we did that and we had a mixed audience of people who would go to a mashara anywhere and people in the university or, or poets or you know people from the, the academic or the writer community who have never encountered this poetry culture before and were having their minds blown and most of the poetry was in Urdu so we you know a lot of people couldn't understand what was being read and it did not matter and ever since then I have wanted to be part of if you like a kind of literary culture in which poetry in particular because that's that's a thing that we've done is a kind of crucible or a medium for cultural exchange um and really all we're doing um is is you know creating a situation like those situations you talk about we always imagine that cultures you know have been historically divided in ways that actually when you go back into the history there was far more exchange than we ever talk about now so it's it's trying to sort of uh you know engender those kinds of exchanges we have a, a multilingual poetry library now public poetry library in my university in which we do events all the time in different languages across cultures um it's the anniversary of windrush at the moment so we had a poetry uh, uh, uh event in the university last week which was largely people from local african caribbean community in manchester coming in um and sharing stories really about their families and their involvement um their families from the windrush generation people were standing up front and effectively witnessing there was a lot of poetry reading as as well so again it's 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 about literature as a form of cultural exchange um and travel writing um yeah travel writing is kind of somewhere in that in that big picture i guess for me mm. i'll just stop talking now no, well, <laughs> really interesting. Talking. well thank you for that um one thing that definitely when you when you um quoted uh the name elizabeth gaskell mm -hmm. uh, you, you know you uh, the, the north and south immediately comes to mind and if anything you know you're you're talking about uh, uh literature's subliminal way of um making that connection uh to a place um and obviously Tarek is overtly unashamedly saying hey this is the location um you know location 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 um and it's, it's interesting seeing that dichotomy um between the two sometimes um but you know Elizabeth Gaskell north and south straight away I'm I'm taken transported to the industrial revolution of the north and uh, you know the advances that were being made and and you're you're right you know it, it does it does resonate straight away um Tarek 
we've had an interesting question um, in the chat section, and I want to bring this out now, even though I'm going to go to the chat in about 10 minutes. Um, but this follows on from, you know, the journey that you were making, you know, you, you showed us the map, you talked about the people you met. Um, Hiba, um, Hiba asks, how receptive were people to your journey? And I think that's a really interesting question. Um, how did they respond when you told them about your aims? I think not only would I like to, I'd like to add a second layer to that. So I'd like to find out how were they receptive on your journey to, the, to your aims, but also taking you right back to the beginning. How, how did you achieve this book deal? I mean, clearly there was an interest or was it more a case of you had to sell the interest? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the... But actually, before that, I should just say I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Manchester because Manchester is currently looking after one of the characters in here who is studying medicine at Manchester University. So my oldest is there, and I spend a lot of time, obviously, going there. And, and it's a great city, and I love it, and I'm so glad she's studying there. So, you know, keep looking after her, Manchester. Um, she's still got three more years left. <laughs> um, she's here at the moment, actually. Um, it wasn't the one that stood up behind me, by the way. Um, <laughs> I was say, a, a very young doctor to be. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> um, so firstly, in terms of reception, it really did depend um, on, on who I was um, talking to. Um, but nine times out of 10, I was approaching people who were very proud of their history and heritage. And when they heard that I wanted to put that on the map, and obviously I, I focused a, a lot on the Muslim voices in this region because I felt like they were not being heard at all. They very rarely had a platform. And in the literature written on these spaces, they were very rarely mentioned in those and they very rarely had a voice. Um, I'm not pretending for one minute I tried to be, you know, um, very, very objective or, or tried to create a balance by going to these voices. And the, that's, that was not my purpose. My purpose was to address a bigger imbalance. So I consciously um, made um, this, this, this decision to speak to a lot of Muslims. And that's why a lot of Muslim voices are there. I speak to imams, I speak to activists, I speak to guides that take me around. I speak to the person, you know, at, at the bus stop or whatever. Um, and most of the time when they heard who I was, what I did and what my work is, they were very positive. You know, um, some, you know, were, were not always as comfortable um, being written in and I left them out and, and they didn't want to necessarily be a part of something or some were happy for me to anonymize them and so on. But the reception was positive in the main. After it got published, um, it was very interesting because now anybody and everybody could see what I was saying and what I was doing. And I did find it interesting that some people were very, very uncomfortable from this area that I was presenting it as quote unquote Muslim. You know, they obviously hadn't read the book because then they would say, you see that I'm not saying that this is somehow all Muslim Europe. I'm trying to make a point here, you know, um, and some people were not comfortable with their country being depicted as a Muslim place with all this rich Muslim history and so on. And some people also felt like maybe I was out to just lionize the Ottomans. And I, and, and I had to point out that, you know, I, I know the Ottomans were an imperial movement. I know they did horrific things, but it's a matter of fact that because of the Ottomans, this region has a Muslim community. So I have to tell that history as well. Um, and I also pointed out to them that if they want to be on the Ottomans deliberately, there's plenty of books because we know that's how the imbalance started. And um, so there's all those things going on. Um, and one of the reasons I lean in this direction is because everything leans in the opposite direction. But it often pretends that it's not leaning at all. And that's where it becomes problematic in that we're, we're, we're told that it's somehow objective um, when you don't have enough of these voices. Um, in terms of getting it published, I really did have to sell myself quite a lot because, of course, as um, yourself and Professor Edwards, by the way, I, I feel amazed and astonished that I'm teaching something to a professor. I should just point that out. You know, this is like a great coup. I, I hope this is recorded so I can use this sound by over and over again, um, Professor <laughs> Edwards, just so you know. Um, but honestly, it's it's been, you know, um, Professor Edwards also pointed out he's naming mainly white privileged men. OK, um, and so when when we when we have this in a particular genre and then you have a brown guy working class immigrant background talking about muslim europe you can imagine from a purely business perspective because publishing is a business let's be blunt okay it was high risk and i was looking in covid 
So it was double high risk. So there was nobody who on, on, you know, none of the big publishers were willing to take that gamble. They said nice things. They said nice things. And in the end, I don't think it's any surprise that a niche travel publisher who maybe had less to lose, but that's not to take any credit away from them because they, they, they loved it from the minute they got it. You know, they, they absolutely fell in love with it and, and they pushed and pushed until I agreed, even though I was looking at some other publishers who I'm not gonna name. Um, but in the end, they took the punt and, and it's paid off massively for them as well. You know, um, but I, I think what happens is when a genre is dominated by a particular um, demographic, what then happens is anybody not from that demographic is viewed as a risk from a kind of business analytical perspective, because it is a business. And one of the reasons, by the way, that it is dominated by, um, quote unquote, white privileged men um, is because um, travel writing is, a, is, is the preserve of the privilege. It's, it, you know, who can travel and write about it without getting paid? People who have money. And so it's very, very difficult. And, and, and also the publishing model, when anybody that's tried to enter it will see that it's, it's, it's financially designed in a way where you've got to have other sources of income to get anywhere in, in the beginning. So it's very tough for, not just for writers from my backgrounds, from an ethnic and, and religious perspective, but working class voices. We have almost no white working class voices in travel literature. You know, um, I, I can think of probably one off the top of my head, and that's only since I've gone into the field in a, in a, in a particular way. So yeah, there's 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 lots of issues there. Mm. And um, may I add that there's a whole host of uh, comedians going into travel programs as well. So if anybody, oh, uh, TV executives out there are interested, I'm a comedian. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> Happy in, to. In happy to take my hairdryer and go out we'll, we'll do it together take us yeah. both Let's you know do it. i can be funny sometimes <laughs> I, I i laughed at a few of your punchlines so Tarek, you've got it and and whilst we are bigging up manchester can i just say a quick hello uh from our chat uh to hiba and rima who are both from manchester who are joining us today so welcome mm -hmm. and from further afield to Jakarta, uh, we have some viewers all the way there. So I think there's going to be a few new visitors to the Balkans from the Far East. Yes. To the east of Europe. I, I, strangely enough, you know, one of the one of the places where a lot of articles about the book kept getting translated was Indonesia. I, really? I don't know how that was happening, but I remember early on thinking, how comes it's only Indonesia you know, that it was happening in? So there would be articles about the book and, and, and how it was exploring Islamic heritage. And it'd come up in, in a local Indonesian newspaper and I'd get obviously a Google alert telling me. And I was like, wow, this is great. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, Tarek, you are you are going big because Indonesia, one of the Absolutely. largest Muslim populations out there. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. That was quite an achievement. Um, so now. Going on from uh, the political to the personal, you did take your family on this trip um, yes. and you survived it because uh, yes. you lived to tell the tale. <laughs> um, as someone who has just become um, a recent new mum, a mum of twins, no less, already drowning in, you know, the feed times, etc. To add travel to that list, um, is something that I'm just about embarking on, or soon to be embarking on. Um, I, I, tell us a little bit about how you survived that journey with two kids, because you know that that's a tough ordeal. Because this is not a typical all-inclusive holiday package, as we oh, as we established at the beginning. This is roughing it till the end. Yeah. Um, and and would you recommend this uh, for uh, young families out there to kind of explore lands that are that are kind of like uncharted territory no i i think um it's it's important to point out that you're seeing in this book the end of a long journey of traveling with the family you know both both my daughters in the book traveled literally in the womb you know and so they didn't have a choice from the beginning and obviously we've been through plenty of painful moments that by the time we did this it was a bit of a breeze they were quite used to falling asleep in the car and waking up in a different country you know falling asleep on a train and realizing that you know it's night time when they so they they they're quite used to it you know both both my daughters had traveled a lot they they really enjoyed it we'd got them used to it at a very early age but it's no surprise that we did such an adventurous trip and the following year by the way we all backpacked around southeast asia together you know which should have been another book but i just didn't have the time and um with, with them 
by this time, you know, they were older. They were, they were far more used to it. You know, all those little practicalities that you're about to experience of taking them to the toilet, of feeding them, of making sure that, you know, when they're hungry, that you get them food, um, even if they insist that's not the reason they're acting so, you know, aggravated or, or irate in that moment. All of those little practicalities. When they were younger, we had to be very careful. You know, we would often go to places on a package holiday and then use that as a base to be a little bit more adventurous and ease them in, which is something, of course, we're, we're, we're doing with, with Madam who, who poked her head up a minute ago because um, we've decided to start again, clearly. And <laughs> so, you know, when, when they're smaller, you have to be sensible and they have to be the center of the travel journeys. You know, they, their needs have to be prioritized. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble. Otherwise, you're going to end up having such a horrific time, you'll never want to travel with them again. And I know people who just won't travel with their children because of because of the negative experiences they've had. Whereas I feel like if you if you if you take, you know, if you take on practical advice, you look at experienced families um, and you listen to what they're saying, the way they pack, the way like a road trip is broken up with with somewhere where, you know, you're going to stop purely for them and they get a play park and and, the, and they stretch their legs and things like that. You know, you, if you build all that in, it is possible. But there's absolutely no denying it's hard work. Of course it is. But, you know, we never did enjoy the sweetest fruits without putting in the most difficult labours. And, and my, my older children now, both of them university age, they look back on these memories fondly. And it's no surprise that both of them have feel no two ways about jumping on a plane by themselves and, and going off to explore places now, which they do quite frequently. Obviously, they're students, so they're completely broke and they can't afford those trips at the moment, but they've made plenty of plans. And in between, you know, they're, they're always traveling. And, and we still travel with them as well, you know, because we love it. So easing your way in is the key takeaway. Yeah. Oh, sorry. One thing I forgot, Nabs, is the reason they were a part of this journey and the reason I did write them into the book is one, I couldn't write them out. They were part of it, you know, physically is also because this is their heritage. You know, this heritage that, that I'm trying to make through my work, shall I say, trying to normalize as part of the discussion of what Europe's cultural narrative is, is their heritage going forward. This, you know, when they look at themselves as Brits as Europeans and of course you, you you're also aware I do a lot of work in British Islamic heritage um this is this is what this is going to be the legacy I, I want to leave behind not just for them but for all our children and our grandchildren you know for your twins I don't, I don't want them having to deal with the same identity issues that I had I don't want them to have to justify their existence or justify being Muslim in Europe I want them to be able to say well do you know Ebli Chelebi? No. All right. Do you know, do you know, you know, Sokolu Mehmet Pasha, these great Europeans who are Muslims and, and be able to put that to people who, who might try and put them down the way we, we've had to, um, you know, be uh, had to had to fight to justify um, our very existence. Well, on behalf of my twins, um, they say thank you for that. You know, paving <laughs> the way to not have to justify your existence, essentially. Yes. Absolutely love that. Um, so I'm going to now open uh, the questions up to the audience who have been uh, absolutely enthralled by this discussion. I've, I've been reading a few complimentary uh, comments. Um, so that, that's full credit to you, Tarek um, and uh, Jess, of course. Um, uh, and there's a political question which struck me uh, with curiosity, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, this comes from Morag Cross. Um, I'm not sure where Morag is writing to us from today, but welcome uh, for joining us. Uh, she asks, to what extent uh, do you think schools sh should tell me about whatever versus uh, people's responsibility to educate themselves? And she also adds uh, that she, um, to, out of her own initiative, knows about the, the region and its history. So, you know, uh, you know yes. to what you know this is, yeah. this I, no, is I, I, know, as a teacher i absolutely understand where she's coming yeah. from by the way morag is in the other city that is going to be looking after a character from here she's in glasgow where my second daughter is about to go off and study art at the glasgow school of art which of course is she knows is a fabulous place um so yes i i, I think Fantastic. it's absolutely the responsibility of schools the governments that dictate the curriculums to make sure that it represents history, heritage and culture as fully as possible. 
And I know that's an evolving landscape. I don't think it's the responsibility of the individuals to go and find out their own history. Nobody has that capacity. It's, it's, it's very difficult. How do you know where to start? If there, if there are no books, if there are nothing pointing to it, how do you even know where to go? You know, people were saying to me, they wouldn't have even visited this place had they not realized how much Islamic heritage there was. And it's been there for six centuries. Mm. That's, that's how blindsided we can become by, by things being normalized. You know, plus, I'm, I, I, even though in spite of my immigrant background, in spite of how challenging all of this is for me, um, you know, being from a kind of working class background, it's really, oh, thank you. Uh, Marag is just congratulating my daughter for getting in. <laughs> um, it's been so tough to do this. It's been so tough financially. It's been so tough from a kind of, you know, trying to find the time whilst juggling, you know, raising kids, paying the mortgage, blah, 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 and all those things that don't come with privilege, you know. And yet I know I'm privileged for having been able to do this. Mm -hmm. I know I'm privileged for having decided instead of putting loads of savings aside for my kids when they want to buy that house, you know, I, I've taken them around the world and shown them the beauty of the world and, and given them experiences that they won't get any other way. And in that respect, they're privileged. Obviously, when, when they end up having to pay for their own mortgage, they're not going to feel as privileged later on because there's no, nothing in the bank for them. But you, you understand my point now. Even I feel privileged. I feel my children were privileged to be able to go and do this. And because I know everybody else who wants this, wants to experience this heritage and history and needs to, can't do this. It's one of the reasons I wrote it. It's because, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to step into Waterstones or whatever and pick this up for a tenner than it is to, to go on this six week epic trip. And of course, travel writing in its essence is meant to be armchair travel. It's, it's, it's not a guidebook. It's not telling you where to go. It's telling you, you don't have to go. I, I've already been and here's what you can see. And so that's why it's in this form as well. But yeah, I absolutely think, you know, the government um, and, and all those who dictate what our national curriculums are have to take responsibility. And you only have to look at the great work people like David Olusogo and that are doing to see how, how misrepresented things are, how poorly, you know, and earlier, just because I'm on this role right now, you know, and Professor Edwards was saying when he started with looking at Manchester's heritage, he looked at various things. And I doubt he would have looked at something as amazing as the fact that there was once something called the Manchester Millet, which may have been one of, you know, Britain's very first Muslim communities where diverse Muslims from various backgrounds lived in such a way that it was dubbed a Manchester Millet using the Ottoman Millet term, you know. This is such a fascinating aspect of Manchester history that I doubt anybody in Manchester right now knows much about, apart from those who I speak to about this stuff, maybe. So, yeah, it's it's about, you know, getting this stuff in there. And so how do you get that's the next question? All right. So so you want to make it better represented. Make room for others. Make room for the other voices. MacFest is doing that here. You know, Professor Edwards is clearly on a mission to try and do that in academia, okay? And in travel writing, we're not saying white privileged men shouldn't write. Their voice is interesting as well. Um, but we've just heard so much of it. So you need to move aside and give, give space to, to me, give space to, you know, female um, brown writers, female black writers, people of different persuasions, different sexuality, whatever. Because then we're going to see things that we are blindsided to as well. I haven't given you everything. Because I'm, I'm also, you know, um, I also have a, a particular lens and I also am ignorant of certain things. We all are, but we have to own that. Mm -hmm. Well, someone who, uh, who thinks your parenting style um, is fantastic is Nigat, who says what you've given to your children is a tool to achieve anything in life. Quite a rare thing. Thank so you. Um, I, I I want to now invite Kesra Shiraz, who is the founder and chief exec of McFest, um, to perhaps ask a question as well. Um, I know Kesra has been tuning in. Uh, Kesra, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And my goodness, what a tremendous discussion. Isn't it fabulous? Really? Oh, absolutely. And you've got people joining from all corners of the world. Um, I think I've been asked to do my video. <laughs> That's right. Hello, everyone. Hey. So from Bung, from Jakarta, from Illinois, early in the morning, from Europe, from everywhere. I'm thrilled. So thank you, everybody joining us from wherever you are. And of course, you've been an amazing host, uh, uh, Nobila. You really have been. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And of course, Jess Edwards, amazing supporter of our MacQuest and with your wonderful contribution, Jess. It's one of the best sessions we've having. So my question, I was supposed to do 
this hosting. But you know what? I'm so glad you're doing it. You're doing a far better job than I would have done. Um, I'm a fellow writer, Tariq, like yourself. And what interests me is the writing aspect, the writing life. Uh, when I wrote my first novel 30 years ago, I was a different person. There was no technology. It was different. You you didn't have so much to do in life. Now I'm trying, sitting on two novels, nowhere near finished, and I'm distracted. My life is full. And even having not having the quality of space to do so. Now, in your case, I was fascinated. I thought, how does he do it? Is it the research, the traveling? When does he record? When does he write? Just give us a flavor of that aspect of your life, the pure logistic life of as a writer i think the logistics are, are different depending on where you are in your life and when i was moonlighting it was a nightmare you know right. i i still had to go in every day and teach full time you know i still had to make sure i picked the children up they were fed they were put to bed and then i would spend my evenings in my study trying to do all the things that i'm now going to explain obviously if you find yourself in a situation where you can have some if not most of your life over to writing then the processes change um, um, uh, sorry, or, or how you perform the processes. I do a lot of my research before I, I put my itinerary together. I look into history and I go out of my way to find the voices and the obscure voices that excite me and interest me. Now, they may not be the same ones for other writers, but clearly I, I, I have a, a, a particular area of interest. I, I tend to look at um, Muslim history um, and, and I will look at it from both sides. I, I would try to pull up on as many Muslim commentators as possible because I want to see it from, from that perspective as well as the other perspective. Um, and, and that helps me build my itinerary. The fact that I, I am so fascinated and passionate about it, often it doesn't feel like work or didn't feel like work. It certainly does now. It didn't feel like work because, you know, sometimes uh, a book about the travels of Ibn Battuta would be my bedtime reading, you know, which most other people would be like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, how dry, you know, and, and it is dry, believe me. Um, Macintosh Smith, when he follows in his footsteps, brings it to life in a better way. Um, so for me, I would always squeeze it in. I'd be sitting on the train on my way to a meeting or, or you know, before I pick up the children or something, I'd, I'd dip in and out. And then when I'm on the journey, uh, a travel writer's um, job is very different to most other writers, as you know, um, novel um, writers and, and, and writers of maybe other nonfiction. You know, I am taking copious amounts of notes. You know, I'm noting everything and anything. And with yes. the um, advent of the digital age that has become easier in many ways because I, I use everything to, to, to make the notes. I have my little black books, tons of them here, but I'm always terrified I'm going to lose them when I'm on the road, because if I lose them, you know, I, I can just imagine completely having a meltdown and hiding from my publishers for the rest of my life. Um, but I also record with my phones, uh, with these devices that are phenomenal, and I have the cloud active so that wow. the meet immediately send it up to the cloud, you know, hopefully the matrix won't collapse and it, I won't lose it all. But you know, I, I take pictures to, to help with my memory, a lot of my pictures, if people look at them, they'll be wondering what on earth is he photographing yeah. this for, but I know why I took that picture. It's because it's, a, it's it evokes something in that moment I might take a picture of something because I smelt something that I want to bring to life I might take a picture of of a place because uh, of something that I heard in a particular way and it will then bring that back to me um I also video things obviously and um as I, I make digital notes when it's not practical to pull out a notepad and a thing and start writing because that yes. will really annoy people and when I'm allowed to and when when people give me permission I will record audio as well so uh, all of those things and then of course the most horrific and biggest task is when you come home and you have to weave it into a yes, narrative of sorts. Absolutely. So you made the most of tech, modern technology, haven't yes, you? Yes, I try. I, I'm very much a dinosaur, but I no, try. No, good for you. Good for you. It really helps in your particular field of travel writing. Yeah. So we've got six more minutes left or five. Is there time for a couple of questions? Naps, if you look at any of the questions in the chat, because we have got two or three. So I think more rags, we've already answered. There's another one somewhere in the chat, if you can have a look to do justice to our audience. Absolutely. So, um, of course, uh, Tarek saw the question and answered. Yeah, he was it very quick, wrong. wasn't he? Uh, he was very, very quick. Yeah. Um, did, uh, How the, he does it? I don't know. He's talking, well. chatting, and he's still looking at the chat at the you same time. You spend time. your whole life multitasking, <laughs> so you have no choice. Oh, listen now, we've got Jess with a question, definitely. Jess, please, your question. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's um, it's really, I suppose, um, again, coming back to the idea that travel writing is is a multiplicitous thing or writing about place and travel, this whole sort of uh, arena of non-fictional writing. 
and it can be more the, the self, the writer, the voice of the, uh, uh, it's always been the case, hasn't it? That it's a form of self-exploration. It's one of the kind of cliches, if you like, about travel writing. So I wondered where you sit with that. I love, I love incidentally, what you've been saying about, you know, bringing yourself to the table and, and, and kind of like um, being very open about the partial nature of your own perspective. Absolutely. And I think what the problem with tra travel writing historically has been that what is a very partial perspective has posed as a universal perspective. Um, so, so that's really interesting. But, you know, for you, how, mu how much do you think you are exploring yourself and developing through this and writing about that process? And how much do you think you're trying to, in a way, set yourself to one side so you can capture the thing that you're, you're writing about? I think it's very difficult to set yourself aside and anybody that s says that they do is is really sh reaching in my opinion because um we, we we I think anybody that has ever studied philosophy or or those areas where you have to discuss objectivity knows it doesn't exist that the pure objectivity is impossible it would involve extinguishing yourself and unless you're a sufi that's not going to happen okay and so we can't extinguish ourselves from who we are so therefore we need to own it but we can still be fair we can still be fair. So, you know, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm saying that, okay, I am going to focus on Muslim voices, I am going to focus on a Muslim history from a Muslim perspective, but I'm going to do it fairly. I'm not going to, you know, necessarily try to just consciously misrepresent them. And I am saying to you that, yes, this is a partialized, you know, this is a bias, quote, to use a better phrase. I mean, I, I know it has negative con connotations. This is a biased take on things. It's because I'm trying to address the fact that it's been biased in the other direction so heavily, so heavily, um, Jess, and you know this, but it's also been normalized as being somehow objective. And that's the danger. That's the terrifying thing. You know, we, the, w when we have this um, domination of a genre, what, what I, of course the popular term is this colonization of a space, when we have that, it's a twofold problem. One, we miss out all the richness. We miss out all the richness and the nuance because we keep getting these narratives of people having existential crisis because they've got very little else to write about um, most of the time. And, and that gets very dull after a while. OK, so that's the first thing, you know, and then and then, of course, they have to be very clever to try and weave something into that, which I've tried to do as well. Um, so that's the first thing we, we 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 don't hear the richness of all the various voices, you know, and then the other side is the dangerous side. The dangerous side is that it normalizes their voices. And then when I speak, people just flick it to one side because I don't look like the authority. I don't look like the BBC news gentleman with his RP voice. I know we've got away from that, but let's be honest, it's still the authoritative voice in people's unconscious. Yeah, I don't look like that. So when I'm speaking, they're already suspicious. Their default position is to wonder what my agenda is. And I'm being transparent about that. I'm here to tell you about Muslim Europe because nobody else has bothered up till now in the popular domain. I'm, I'm not some kind of, you know, Captain Cook or whatever else. I know some of my language often alludes to that. And it's very difficult to get away from that because there is a marketing job to be done here as well. And I remember speaking to someone I, I admire a great deal saying that they worry about the, how I've exoticized this a little bit, maybe in the other way. And my thing is, you know what, if that's what needs to be done to get it in front of people for now, we can then fix that later as well. And I'm sure there's going to be problematic issues there. Even with Elia Chelebi, um, Professor Edwards, there are problems. He's from a privileged Muslim background. So I knew I couldn't find a working class Muslim background back then because they weren't given the voice. When we look back in history, who has the voices? The voices are the privileged because they're the only ones who could read and write anyway. So, so we have to navigate that. We can't change that. So we have to find a way to kind of redress that. It's the same when you look at Manchester's history, who had the voices. There's a reason why you don't know about the Manchester Millet, because the people who were in it weren't allowed to write about it. And if they wrote about it, it didn't make the front, front page or, you know, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Tariq. Uh, you know, I totally agree with you about the voice and everything else. I, we are nearly at the end, but I really want to give um, another question to you. Any books you would recommend on travel writing, please? This is by Park. And after this, we will finish, please. A any book I would recommend on travel writing? Gosh, that's a really big question. Um, yeah, I, I do, in, in the popular area right now, I'm, I'm really loving Manisha Rajesh's train writing. She's great. You know, um, she's somebody I love to read. Um, she's written about 80 trains around um, India. She's written about trains around Europe, um, around the world. And I find it very, very frustrating that even though she's 
clearly the queen of train travel writing. She still doesn't get the TV shows. There's always someone else who who usually is a white male that ends up. Michael Patilla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say anything, but yeah. Um, and in terms of, you know, um, historic travel writing um, or, or, you know, travel writers of the past, there, there, sometimes there's no getting away from some of the people that I did uh, I did like who, you know, they're, they're also white male. I, I always loved William Dalrymple's travel writing when he used to do travel writing. And William Dalrymple is one of those great people who concedes the problems with him being who he is. You know, it, it is what it is. And he can't get away from that. But he, he, he at least tries to own it, in my opinion, a bit more. And his travel writing was very inspiring for me as a young man, long before I read Saeed and that, um, because I loved his style. He, he, he does what I've tried to do, which is, you know, take you on this journey, but really bring lots of in-depth um, history, but with a light touch so that you're not falling asleep while you're reading it. Well, on that note, um, Tarek, thank you so much for joining us today in conversation about your travel writing experience. Um, Nigat asks, uh, what would the starting point be as a travel writer? May I take this opportunity, Nigar, to say uh, mountains, uh, minarets in the mountains uh, might be that very destination. <laughs> um, yeah. Once again, uh, Professor Jess Edwards, Kesra Shiraz, uh, Tarek Hussain, thank you so much for this enthralling panel. Um, chit chat and um i know i'm inspired perhaps Tarek, we will get you again on mcfest uh perhaps to explore to. the manchester millet who knows yes. next installment absolutely uh, inshallah <laughs> thank you so um, much Nabs, for being such a great host you know this uh, the, the conversation yeah, is really absolutely. about the host you've really put it together in such a fabulous way um, and of you. course Kasia, thank you so much for inviting me it's a real honor and pleasure to be here and professor edwards thank you so much for sharing your time with us it's been an absolute education to be in your company as so, well Tarek, you. you've been a brilliant brilliant presenter absolutely riveting and great at presenting so we'll have to call it today so thank you all of you uh obviously nabs for hosting Tarek for our amazing contribution and professor jess for giving his sunday and adding to our event and finally, can't say enough to all our audience from around the world, you know, who've given us that time early in the morning, late at night, it's nearly midnight in Jakarta, sitting with us <laughs> and contributing. And I hope you enjoyed it. It was worth every single second, I'm sure it is. So inshallah, we'll see you next time for our next uh, a digital panel. Or if you want a live event, uh, we have Eid Celebrating for Women, musical at the Lowry Theatre. So inshallah. Good uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.